Good morning. Hello, everyone. My name is Deshaun, and I'll be glad uh, to share God's word with you today. Uh, but before I do, do that, I do want to read the scripture uh, that we'll be covering today. We are in John uh, chapter 10. We'll be looking at verses 1 through 21. What's so interesting about this time, um, specifically the time uh, leading up to Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, was that a lot of people, most people, if not all people, believed in some type of God. Uh, this thing of, of not believing in God was not really around. No atheism. And so it was just a matter of who you believed in. And so we're going to come upon a time or a section of scripture in which Jesus really highlights what it means to know God and how you kind of develop a relationship with him. So we're going to talk about the good relationship today. So I'm going to read to you verses 10, 1 through 21 in John chapter 10. Truly I tell you, anyone who doesn't enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in some other ways, a thief and a robber, the one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens it for him and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought all of his own outside, he goes ahead of them. The sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will never follow a stranger. Instead, they will run away from him because they don't know the voice of strangers. Jesus gave this figure of speech but did not understand what he was telling them. Jesus said again, truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to him, to them. I am the gate. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will come and go and find pasture. A thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come so that they may have life and have it in abundance. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, since he is not the shepherd and doesn't own the sheep, leaves them and runs away when he sees a wolf coming. The wolf then snatches and scatters them. This happens because he is a hired hand and doesn't care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the father knows me and I know the father. I lay down my life for the sheep, but I have other sheep that, not, that are not from this sheep pen. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. Then there will be one flock, one shepherd. This is why the father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own. I have the right to lay it down, and I have the right to take it up again. I have received this command from my father. Again, these Jews were divided because of these words. Many of them were saying, he has a demon and he's crazy. Why do you listen to him? Others were saying, these aren't the words of someone who is demon-possessed. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? So we're going to see this morning just what Jesus was referring to. What a beautiful song. The song says the grave could not keep him. The grave could not hold him. That's a promise to all Christians. The grave cannot keep you. We lost one of our own this past week in Gwen. But one thing that's good is that the grave will not keep her. There's a promise that one day she will rise when he comes back. And we're here today not just to do church, not just to have a service, but this is a means to the end. Because one day he is coming. That's a promise. And I want us to be excited about that. I want us to know that although, although like our friend Gwen went home to be with the Lord, although right now her physical shell is in the grave, but oh, best believe that one day, one day she will rise. She will rise and live forever. And that is the glorious promise of a Christian. That is the glorious truth. And that's what I have as a follower of Jesus. And I will die for that truth. And I will live for that truth all the days of my life. And I hope that God speaks to you today that you will do the same. 
Father, I, I love you so much. I love you because we have a promise that we're going to rise again. I love you because you saved me from my sin. I love you because you've paved the way. I love you, Father, so much. I can't even express it in words. If I had 10,000 tongues, it wouldn't be enough to express the graciousness and how good you are. Father, I pray during this time today that you would speak to each and every one of us that we would hear from you and that we would just be encouraged and excited to change our lives, to look less like the world and more like you. I thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Can I borrow this? Can I borrow this? Can you raise it for me? I'd invite you to follow along in your bulletins um, to take some notes. We'll be covering a few things, and I, I think it's good to uh, write down what you hear. I believe that you remember more when you write it down, so let's do that. As I've already said, my, na my name is Deshaun, and for those who don't know, this is my wife, Jessica. Uh. See, I hugged her because that's my wife. I can do that. I actually thought about kissing her, but I wanted to stay focused on the, on the, on the task at hand, so I, I thought not to kiss her. Um, but I can do that because I have a relationship with her. I have a relationship with my wife, and we know that relationships matter. Think about it. Most of us, if not all, at some point or another, we, we, we look to make a relationship with someone we meet. And it might be something uh, uh, where it's, it's the, the employer on the other side of the desk as we're going through a job interview. It might be that teacher in which we're new to that class. It may be a friend in which we meet at some type of gathering or school or, or church and we think that they, we would have a lot in common. So we try to uh, meet them and, and form some type of relationship. Now, we often try to form a relationship through impression, right? We try to impress someone, especially when we try to have a relationship with someone on, on that first date. When you meet a woman or a man and, and you try to do something or, or not do something silly or say something or not say something silly. Uh, uh, Jessica and I never dated, so and she became my wife, so she must have been impressed somehow <laughs> or <laughs> But, but, but that's a true story, actually. We never dated. But that's not the point. The point is that we do sim simply try to impress. There was a group of people, I think, and we even try to impress the, the uh, God. We try to impress God, and that's what the Pharisees did. There's a group of people in, in Scripture named the Pharisees, and they tried to impress God. I'm going to tell you how. They tried to uh, ensure that they were always found to, to wear the most prestigious uh, um, 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 linen and the most prestigious robes, and they were always found to be at the front of the synagogue praying and that people can hear them and praying on the street corners. They wanted to impress with their goodness, their righteousness. They even wanted to impress the other people to make sure that the other people knew who were the holy people, who were the good people, who were the leaders. And so they tried to... Rep they try to impress. And so what we find here in scripture, I'm going to go back to last week. We find here that the Pharisees were so much trying to impress God and, and impress each other that they actually kicked out a blind man from the temple. They kicked him out. They said, you don't belong here. That this man, Jesus had just healed, gave him his sight. And because the man said it was Jesus, and because the Pharisees said, you're a follower. You know, you, we follow Moses. You follow this guy. Get out of here. And they shunned him. We, let, we learned last week that Jesus found the man, asked him, hey, do you believe that I'm, I'm the son of man? The guy was like, yeah, show me him. The guy said, do you believe in the son of man? The guy said, show me him so that I may believe. He said, I am he. He said, yes, I believe. And so we see that as the Pharisees tried to impress God and impress people, they ended up actually missing and kicking out someone who was of God. They completely missed it. They completely shunned away the person who was of God. But yet Jesus found him. And Jesus 
said something different. He, he set a new code. He, he actually explained to the Pharisees and, and to the people what it really means to be in the kingdom of God. And so what he did, he, he explained this by using a story of natural elements to convey a spiritual truth. Or what we know and sometimes call a parable. And he compares himself to a gate. He also compares himself to a shepherd. He also goes on to compare a sheep pen, a, shep, a sheep pen, sheep, and a shepherd. He uses these natural examples to compare what the kingdom of heaven, how it really is, how it really operates. And he uses this analogy to make this relationship comparison example of how a shepherd and a sheep in the kingdom of heaven. And so we see, number one, the relationship to Jesus in, in verse uh, John 10, verses 1 and 2. It says, truly I tell you, anyone who doesn't enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. Sheep, that we know that they, they were, at this time, they were means of living. They were good for meat, wool, uh, they were good for these type of things. Uh, sheep also... Uh, were a resource to the community. Uh, a wealthy landowner probably would have hired a shepherd for the sheep to graze and harvest the area. The sheep were also needed by a shepherd. They were defenseless. They had, uh, they, they would easily get lost. They would, they would just, they needed someone to take care of them. So Jesus is, is, is all off the, off, right off um, this relationship. He's comparing people to sheep. He, he said that they need a shepherd. He also said of a shepherd, that the shepherd is a, they are the keeper of sheep. They're the ones who guide the sheep, that protect the sheep, care for the sheep, raise up the sheep, love the sheep, rescue the sheep, feed the sheep. And that the shepherd is willing to put himself in danger in order to protect his sheep. A shepherd was also um, the one who kept the sheep pen. All the, the, the shepherd's sheep that he owned were put into a sheep pen or a sheep fold at night. And he would watch them until the morning. And he would make sure they were there until the morning. A shepherd had dedication for his sheep. Something like sheep would have been would have seen as very insignificant because of their help. Because they needed help. And because they were just animals that were considered dumb and uh, with some, without a leader, they were, they were helpless. And so shepherds made sheep very significant. Why? Because a shepherd is willing and would be willing to put his life in danger for the sheep. To, go, to, to lay it all down for the sheep. That he, he lived, he, he lived, his morning, noon, and night was for the sheep. Everything he did was for the care and the protection of the sheep. Verse 3 says, the gatekeeper opens it for him, and his sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. A sheep and the shepherds were so close. They're, that relationship was so intimate that there were these public, at times, uh, sheep pens. So there'd be multiple herds of sheep that belonged to different herdsmen or different sh shepherds. And they would go, the shepherds would go to the sheep pen and call his specific sheep by name. And then they would all come out towards him. The sheep that did not belong to the shepherd would stay back. But his sheep, the ones he owned, would, would come out. And follow him. That's the, how close the relationship was. If, if others um, tried to mimic the voice of the shepherd or tried to act as though they were the shepherd, the sheep would not listen because they knew the voice of a stranger. Verse 4 through 5 says, uh, when he has brought out all his own sheep outside, he goes ahead of them. The sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will never follow a stranger. Instead, they will run away from him because they don't know the voice of strangers. It's amazing how soon as a shepherd would stand call for the sheep, how they would poke up. Their attention would be had and they would start running towards the sheep and other sheep would see that they're running towards their shepherd and, and join along. The next thing you know, there's 10, 20, 
15, however many sheep running towards this one person and standing guard, standing attention, attentive to the shepherd. And they would not go to anyone else. That's why a thief or a robber had to come in and find some other way because they, uh, they would not be able to draw a sheep towards them, but they would have to jump in and try to steal a sheep if they wanted to, because again, it was a means of life. So Jesus gave this figure of speech, as it says in verse 6, but they did not understand him. He gave this figure of speech because they, did, and it, because they wanted to share the relationship between how God's kingdom worked. He wanted that to be known because the Pharisees had thought it was, it was by how, how they uh, perceive the kingdom. They thought they were the gatekeepers. They thought they were the ones who can tell someone how good you need to be. They thought they could tell someone how they needed to behave, how they need to act it. But if you didn't resemble uh, that of the Pharisee, that maybe you just weren't holy. Maybe you just weren't of God. They thought they were the ones who determined the entrance to the kingdom of heaven or, or how the kingdom of heaven worked. But Jesus gave this figure of speechless analogy to say, no, no, this is not how it is. It's similar to a relationship. The kingdom of heaven operates similar to the, a relationship between a shepherd and his sheep. But they did not understand. The fairies, they were blown away by this. See, the gate to the sheep pen was similar to how the, the kingdom of heaven. Jesus, as a shepherd, he owned and led sheep. Sheep were the people who believed in him by faith. That being born of sin, as the, as the Pharisees uh, 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 said in a, in a, to the blind man, uh, that he couldn't be of God because he was born entirely in sin. Being born in sin was not indicative of whether or not you, can, you were in the kingdom of heaven. We were all born and conceived in sin. But do we turn from that sin. Well, well, Jesus is, is getting at something here. He's getting at something. And so he used this figure of speech to indicate that there is no other way into a right standing with God unless you are known by Jesus and led by Jesus. Jesus' story reveals that the very people the Pharisees did not want a relationship with or did not believe belong to God actually did actually were significant because just like the blind man they were known by Jesus and led by Jesus Jesus said that if you didn't go through the gate you were not of his herd you were not of one of his sheep because remember the shepherds kept the sheep pen so if you didn't enter in to the gate of the sheep pen, you could not have been one of the sheep, either a thief or a robber. And so Jesus right now is setting the relationship between people and him and comparing it to a sheep and his shepherd. And just like my wife, we may all have someone in which we're in a relationship with, whether it's a coworker, a friend, a spouse, a teacher, a friend, whomever, and we need to remember that these relationships matter, that these relationships really, if you think about it, point to Christ, and we'll get there. I talked about how a sheep is known by their shepherd. So number two, a good relationship also means that they're known by Jesus. Look at verse 7 and 8. Jesus said again, Truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep didn't listen to them. And so uh, um, the, the sheep pen is, is the area in which the shepherd would lead his sheep in at night. And the shepherd would stand at the gate. And he would use his instruments, whether a rod or a staff, he would use a rod and count each sheep as they entered into the gate. He would count each one, if, and when he recognized that one was missing, he would go out and find it. But here's the thing. He knew each and every one of them. He actually said, I am the gate. I am the gate. 
Jesus was using this description to describe himself, I am the gate, as, his, as to signify his relationship between humanity, his purpose in this world, and his relationship to mankind. Jesus said, I am the gate for the sheep. He is saying, since I am the entrance, I know all who come through. Because he is the gate, all who call themselves followers of Jesus is known by him. For instance, Jessica and I got married in 2019. We had a, um, a wedding, of course, and we had a guest list, and we knew everyone on that guest list. In fact, we even set up gatekeepers so that, so that when they came in, they were checked on the list, and I'm sure other people went in other ways, but that's besides the point. They came in through a certain area which they had to meet the gatekeepers. And everyone, and that was just a check off if they were a part of the wedding because you know you have to pay for everybody that comes. And so we made sure that those who were there were known by us, were known to be on that list. In similar ways, you can't be a follower of Jesus if you're not known by him because he is the way in which we are to get into heaven. He is the way in which we are to be one of his. We, he has to know us. We have to be known by Jesus. The Pharisees were not known by God because they did not go through Jesus. They did not go through the gate. They went by their own way, their own wisdom, their own righteousness, their own goodness, as, the, as they thought that was the way to reach God. Self-centered instead of being God-centered. That's why Jesus, and he understands this, but that's why in Matthew 7 he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name, drive out demons in your name, and do many miracles in your name? Then I'll announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. Being known by Jesus. And the scripture says, doing the will of the Father. You never did the will of the Father. Well, how do we come through Jesus? How do we do the will of the Father? The will of the Father is Jesus. The bottom line, the will of the Father is, is through Jesus. How do you get to heaven? How do you, how do you be a part of this kingdom of heaven? through Jesus. Well, well, how do you go through Jesus? How do you do that? Well, I first thought, let's take a look at the example of the sheep. Completely dependent upon their shepherd. Acknowledgement of their helplessness. Completely lost without a shepherd. Completely vulnerable. Completely prone to attacks of thieves and wolves, completely prone to death without someone leading them, potentially could fall off a cliff, fall into danger. So if I take the, the, the example of, of sheep and understanding how they're so just dependent upon the shepherd, then I can understand and start to relate how I can come to Jesus about being totally dependent upon Jesus, acknowledgement of my lostness without him, acknowledgement of how I am uh, prone to, to danger and to death without him, how I'm so vulnerable without him. And I take that and let him be my guide, be my shepherd, be my, my lead and my care recognizing that as the sheep would recognize that the shepherd would, would go out before them and lay down his life for them, recognizing that Jesus would do the same. So Jesus, that's why Jesus came, ran out and assured the blind man that he is part of the kingdom. Not because of what the Pharisee says, but because he came, the blind man came through Jesus. He went through the gate, through Jesus. And the Pharisees did not understand this figure of speech that Jesus mentioned. So have to be known by Jesus. It just reminds me of life. And just as the sheep are known by the shepherd, how people 
that we know, I find that when they're able to listen to you, when, when you want to share the gospel, when you want to share about Jesus, what you believe is precious and you hold closely, they're much more willing to listen and open up to you when they feel as though you've listened to them. Or when you feel as though, when they feel as though they have, or they are known by you. They'll be much more willing to, to open up. And maybe then we can have a, a conversation, a fruitful conversation that leads them towards Jesus. Because Jesus, number three, cared, cares for us. The sheep were also cared for by Jesus. Jesus said in verse nine, I am the gate. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will come in and go and find pasture. See, a sheep, once they went into the sheep pen with the shepherd or led into the sheep pen with the shepherd, the shepherd knew who that sheep was, that it, that sheep belongs to me. I know this sheep by name. Knew it, knew it whatsoever. And, and at that point, and I don't know if the sheep knew this, but it seems like they could because of how attentive they are to the shepherd's voice. But a sheep instinctively would know once they are part of a shepherd's flock, how safe they were. They knew that because I'm being led by this sheep, I can go and be led by this shepherd. And so we, would, we see, as scripture says, that the sheep were saved. Saved from being defenseless, saved from the threat of, of harm, saved from the fear of death. And in the same way, Jesus cares for his people by saving them. Saving them from the things that would cause harm and damage to relationships. Save them from, from things that would cause them to damage their relationship ultimately with him. Saved from the penalty of sin. Saved from the fear of death saved from the wrath of God, saved from the fear that illness will have a final say, saved from the, the fact that death may actually keep me there, saved from all of these things that humans fear. Yes, we still may encounter them at times, but Jesus promised us that he's conquered this world. And so he cares for us in the fact that he saves us, and all we had to do is call upon the name of the Lord, as it says in Romans 10, 13. Jesus also says that he who enters the gate will have life and pasture. I see that when it says they will be able to come in and go out and find pasture. That shepherd would lead these sheep over into a pasture to openly graze freely without fear of wolves, without fear of attack, without fear of, of anything. And so what's so cool about a pasture is that that was life for a sheep. That it was the fulfillment of life for a sheep to be able to graze. That's what they did. And a shepherd would ensure that they were able to do that securely, safely, with all that they need. And that's the same thing in which Jesus is, is saying he does for those who belong to him. That I will allow you to, to live in the, in the pasture of peace. The, the pasture of assurance that there is life after death. The, the pasture of significance. The pasture of freedom. The pasture of not being concerned with the expectations of the world. The pasture of being uh, freed from a uh, 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 feeling as though uh, uh, death will have the final say. The pasture of, of being afraid of the person who can harm the body but can't uh, take this, harm the soul. The same way in which a she shepherd provides that openly graced pasture for a sheep is the same way Jesus is explaining to everyone who's listening how he provides that life, that fulfillment of life for all who are his. But we must enter through the gate. And that gate is, it, is Jesus. Well, why does this matter? Because any other attempt to have full life, any other attempt to have pasture, any other attempt to get right with God that's not through Jesus is false. It's a lie. It's not true. It's unattainable. But through Jesus. That's why he said in John 10.10, 10, a thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come so that you may have life and have it in abundance. 
because the shepherd provided all that he wanted. That if, you, if you're not actually going through Jesus, it's just an attempt by someone or something to steal, to kill, and to destroy what God really has for you. Any other way of being saved except through Jesus, it just is another way for someone to steal, kill, and destroy you. Any other way uh, to have some great life besides through Jesus is just a thief trying to steal, kill, and destroy that life that Jesus wants for you. Any other way to get to God, to have freedom from sin uh, besides Jesus is just another attempt to steal, kill, and destroy what Jesus has for us. That's why it's important. Jesus wants us to know anything else besides me is just a, a theft, a bid at destruction. Anything else, anything you desire in life, anything that you think is happening after this life, anything that's outside of me is an attempt to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus is saying, I'm here as your shepherd. Because eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, nor has the heart conceived the things that God has prepared for those who love him. That's the pasture. That's the pasture. We don't even know what we're going to do. We don't even know the greatness, that open pasture that God has for those who love him. But he gives us an example in the way a shepherd cares for his sheep. Cared cared, cared by Jesus. We are cared and loved by Jesus. And number four, we are led by Jesus. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Not only he's the gate, not only is he cares for us, but he leads us. Unlike the Pharisees who led people astray, who led people to their own purposes, their own devices. And this was actually prophesied and actually happened back in Ezekiel 34, where God says, Woe to the shepherds of Israel who have been feeding themselves. Shouldn't the shepherds feed their flock? You have not strengthened the weak, healed the sick, bandaged the injured, brought back the strays, or sound or soothed the lost. Instead, you have ruled them with violence and cruelty. with violence and cruelty. So instead, Jesus says, God says, I'm going to send a shepherd and it's going to be Jesus. We see that in Ezekiel 34, 22. I will save my flock. The, the Pharisees should have recognized this as they read the laws and they understood the prophets, apparently. I will save my flock. They will no longer be prey and I will judge between one sheep and another. They should have recognized that as, he's, as Jesus is laying out this analogy, laying out this parable, they should have remembered the prophets and remembered Ezekiel and what he said and how there were people who were leading them away, but then God said, I will be the one to come and send them. That I will send my shepherd, my servant David, and he will shepherd them. He will tend them for himself, and he will be their shepherd. And here's what Jesus does. We think of leading, being led by as a place of honor. And it is a place of honor, but not because of might and authority, but because of servanthood. Someone said this morning in our small group that if you want to follow Jesus, look at his hands and look at his feet and do the same thing. And so as Jesus led people, as he described in the shepherd, and in a shepherd, we understood that he was willing, a shepherd was willing to lay down his life. That a shepherd is a humble, lowly servant that, he, that, that, that only comes to be served and not to serve. Yes, Jesus is mighty and he's king of kings and lord of lords and authority and has all authority, the example he set, however, on earth was to be that one of a lowly servant, shepherd that would lay his life down. And he did that. He laid his life down. 
And as we attempt to lead people to Jesus, as we follow after him, are we willing to lay our lives down? Are we willing to get dirty like a shepherd? Get, get in dangerous situations? No, don't, don't, don't back away when things get difficult, when things get trying, when things call for our resources, our time, our effort. But when we make sure and we understand that, man, if I want to follow after Jesus and lead people as he led, as a shepherd does a flock, well, maybe I just have to give all my life to it. Give all your life to this. Give all your life to following Jesus. That's why it's important for us today. Jesus, as Philippians says, who did not, who existed in the form of God, did not take, consider, did not consider equally himself, equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had came as a man, he humbled himself by being obedient to the point of, of death, even death on a cross. Jesus' point of sharing a sh his relationship with people as a relationship that a shepherd has with a flock or a sheep is that that shepherd's highest priority, highest purpose was to protect the sheep sacrificing unlike the hired hand as Jesus goes on to say in verses 12 and 13 since he is not the shepherd and doesn't own the sheep leaves them and runs away when he sees a wolf coming the wolf then snatches and scatters them this happens because he is a hired hand and doesn't care about the sheep wow doesn't care but the sheep actually matter. The sheep matter to Jesus. The sheep matter to the shepherd. And as we follow Jesus, and if we believe that there are people out there who need Jesus, we ought to think that they matter too. That they have a shepherd out there. They may not even know it yet that cares. And if we are to even demonstrate or allude to or be a light for them to see the true shepherd, we have to take after the same role of Christ as a shepherd. It's going to cost you something. But it, you have to ask yourself, am I willing? It's going to cost you something. But the scripture says that Jesus set his eyes towards the cross because he saw the great joy that lied ahead. And so I'm here to tell you that if, you, if we're willing to, to let it cost something, to lay it down our lives in order to share Jesus, I promise you because scripture says there's great joy. Verse 14 and through 16 says, Jesus goes on to say, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me just as the father knows me and I know the father. I lay down my life for the sheep, but I have other sheep that are not from this sheep pen. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. Then there will be one flock and one shepherd. The relationship between Jesus and his followers are so close, are so, is so intimate that just as Jesus and God are the same, so are the sheep. And so is Jesus, one together. And as the Pharisees listened as he spoke in Jerusalem, they didn't even understand what he was talking about. That So you mean to tell me now you have more sheep from another sheep pen? What are you, what are you saying? What are you, what are you saying? And what Jesus is getting at here is that he has more that that regardless of where someone's was born regardless of what someone looks like regardless of if they were conceived in sin when they come through me they become part of my flock see the pharisees thought that that only people that looked like them that were were 100 percent is uh jewish and hebrew were able to enter the kingdom of god jesus is saying i have more sheep that are not part of this pen. And when I go and receive them, we will be one sheep, one flock, and one shepherd. 
And so, yes, there's going to be people that look different than you and me, that sound different, that talk different, that look different, that act different. But just as though Jesus scouted out and went to go find that blind man who the Pharisees rejected, I'm here to tell you that the kingdom of heaven is open to everyone who would receive and believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And that no one comes to the Father except through him. Because number five, sheep are loved. Loved by Jesus. 17 and 18 says, this is why the fathers love me. Because I laid down my life so that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own. I have the right to lay it down and have the right to take it up again. I have received this command from my father. Jesus is going to lay down his life as any good shepherd would do. Going to face the danger, going to face the fear of being separated from God, going to face everything that a sheep would face if they didn't have a leader. He's going to become a sin offering for God and God is going to pour out his wrath on him and he will die and be separated from God as a result. The difference between this sacrifice and anything else that has been put to death is that Jesus in this sacrifice rose again and now lives forever. He has done this and will do this because of his love for the sheep. That's why Romans 3.26 says, God presented him as in Jesus to demonstrate his righteousness, his goodness at the present time so that he would be righteous and declare righteous the one, the person who has faith in Jesus. Jesus was, Jesus is his sacrifice. Jesus is laying down of his life was all in service to us. For anyone who believe, greater love, as John 15, 13 says, greater love, there's no greater love than this, than to lay, that a man would lay down his life for his friends. The words of a loving shepherd, he did it all for, he did it for all who would believe. And this is not just something that the Pharisees should have recognized then, or that we should know now. This is something that even David recognized Back in Psalm 23, where he said, the Lord is my shepherd. I have what I need. The Lord is my shepherd. Jehovah Ra'a. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. I have all that I need. That's how much he loves me. That like those sheep, he would lead me to green pastures. He would lead me beside still water. He renews my life. He makes my life new in him. He leads me along the right path. What path should I be following? The right path. Who leads us to the right path? Jesus. David knew this. We need to know this. He leads me along the right path for his name's sake, for his glory. Jesus. David knew this well before Jesus came to earth to live, die, and rise. Again, Jesus. David knew that God would provide a savior. And he expressed that in Psalm 23. In verse 4, it goes on to say, Even when I go through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff comfort me. The love of God will take us through, just like a shepherd would go through the darkest valley. The thing about a sheep is as they walk through the darkest valley, as a sheep walk through the scariest parts of the valley, that they trusted where they were going, and they would continue to follow the shepherd because they knew that the shepherd had cleared the way. In the same way, David was so confident in God, no matter what life looked like, no matter what trial or tribulation God that was brought to life that Jesus would guide him and Jesus would do the same thing today because he is that loving shepherd because his rod he knows us his rod knows us I know my sheep and you're going to follow me and we need to trust him in that way we need to trust him in every single way that we can. And in verse 5 and 6 says, You prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Only goodness and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord as long as I did. This is not possible unless Jesus died and rose again. 
It is not possible. You mean to tell me the peace that Jesus gives, that he would put me in front of my enemies and have a table set before me, that I would be at peace, be able to eat? Oh, think of the word picture of Psalm 23, that you anoint me, that, that you give me what I need, that it's just overflowing, that I have enough to give more of. And that guess, only goodness and faithful love. That word there is said. God's said is a Hebrew word that means loyalty, that means faithfulness, that means love and kindness will continue to follow you. That means if you are a part of Jesus, his loyalty, his faithfulness, his love and kindness will continue to follow you all the days of your life. Never ending, never ceasing, regardless of what you go through, the darkest valley, his loving ending love, mercy, grace will continue to follow you and be with you if you would believe. And he ends it by saying, I will dwell in his house forever. If no, if someone says that Jesus is not love, they don't know what they're talking about. This is a God who would lay down his life for us. And I want this message to be told all across the world. And it starts here. Warwick needs more churches. Warwick needs more believers. And it's going to start with the people that God has chosen to do that and I'm raising my hand to say go so I'm asking everyone to do the same not for me but for God's sake because the world needs a shepherd will you follow will you give your entire life will you see that the kingdom of heaven is like a shepherd and his sheep. Jesus found the guy after he got kicked out. We're not going to find the sheep in here. Jesus found them out there and said, you believe in me? You're one of mine. We're not going to find the sheep coming here. We're gonna, the, means, the means to the end is getting built up here to make sure that out there they know about the shepherd. And that's what Jesus wants us to know. It's not about religion. It's about, do you have a relationship with me? And so that's the first question as the worship team comes back up here. The first question that we have to ask ourselves is, do we have a relationship with him? And if we do, the next question is, how do I live my life such that people know that I am loved cared by, led by, known by, and have a relationship to Jesus. That is a very good relationship.